Good day and welcome to wherever you are listening to us today. It's Monday, 22 March, 2021. My name is Christian Lindmeier and I am welcoming you to today's global COVID-19 press conference. Simultaneous interpretation is provided in the six official languages, Arabic, Chinese, French, English, Spanish, and Russian, plus Portuguese and Hindi. Let me introduce the participants. Present in the room are Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, WHO Director General. Dr. Mike Ryan, Executive Director for Health Emergencies Program at WHO. Dr. Maria van Kerkhove, the Technical Lead on COVID-19. Dr. Maria Angelo Simao, Assistant Director General for Access to Medicines and Health Products. Dr. Sumya Swaminathan, Chief Scientist. Dr. Bruce Aylward, Special Advisor to the Director General and the Lead on ACT Accelerator. And last but not least, we also have Dr. Teresa Kasaiwa, the Director for the WHO Global TB Program. We have a couple of colleagues online, but we'll get to them when we get there. With this, let me hand over to the Director General for the opening remarks. Thank you, thank you, Christian. Vielen Dank. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. This Wednesday is World TB Day. In the past year, the COVID-19 pandemic has caused severe disruption to services for many diseases, including tuberculosis. An estimated 1.4 million fewer people received care for TB in 2020 compared with 2019. And we fear that more than half a million more people may have died. TB is preventable and treatable, but remains one of the world's top infectious killers because too many people go undiagnosed. Improved screening is essential to rapidly identify people with TB infection or disease and connect them with care. New guidance from WHO aims to help countries identify groups at highest risk of TB so people can receive services for prevention and treatment. In January, I said that the world was on the brink of a catastrophic moral failure unless urgent steps were taken to ensure equitable distribution of vaccines. We have the means to avert this failure, but it's shocking how little has been done to avert it. The gap between the number of vaccines administered in rich countries and the number of vaccines administered through COVAX is growing every single day and becoming more grotesque every day. Countries that are now vaccinating younger, healthy people at low risk of disease are doing so at the cost of the lives of health workers, older people, and other at-risk groups in other countries. The world's poorest countries wonder whether rich countries really mean what they say when they talk about solidarity. The inequitable distribution of vaccines is not just a moral outrage. It's also economically and epidemiologically self-defeating. Some countries are racing to vaccinate their entire populations while other countries have nothing. This may buy short-term security, but it is a false sense of security. The more transmission, the more variants. And the more variants that emerge, the more likely it is that they will evade vaccines. And as long as the virus continues to circulate everywhere, anywhere, people will continue to die. Trade and travel will continue to be disrupted. And the economic recovery will be further delayed. 
On Friday, WHO hosted a meeting of more than 800 experts on enhancing genomic sequencing of the SARS-CoV-2 virus globally uh, to improve the monitoring of its evolution. Knowing when, how, and where the virus is evolving is vital information. But it's of limited use if countries do not work together to suppress transmission everywhere at the same time. If countries wouldn't share vaccines for the right reasons, we appeal to them to do it out of self-interest. There are some countries that have set a great example. The Republic of Korea, despite being a high-income country that could easily afford to buy vaccines through bilateral deals, has waited its turn for vaccines through COVAX. WHO is continuing to work day and night to find solutions to increase the production and equitable distribution of vaccines. I have had conversations with leaders from high-income countries that have many times more doses than they need, asking them to share doses through COVAX. I have had conversations with leaders from lower-income countries whose economies are suffering and who are asking when they will get vaccines. And I have had conversations with executives from vaccine manufacturers about how to ramp up production. Recently, for example, I spoke to the CEO of AstraZeneca, Pascal Soriot, about the shared challenges we face in ramping up production and rolling out vaccines. So far, AstraZeneca is the only company that has committed to not profiting from its COVID-19 vaccine during that, the pandemic. And so far, it's the only vaccine developer that has made a significant contribution to vaccine equity by licensing its technology to several other companies, including SK Bio in the Republic of Korea and the Serum Institute of India, which are producing more than 90% of the vaccines that have so far been distributed through COVAX. We need more vaccine producers to follow this example and license their technology to other companies. A year ago, Costa Rica and WHO launched the mechanism to do this the COVID-19 Technology Access Pool, or CTAP, which promotes an open science model where licensing would occur in a non-exclusive, transparent manner to leverage as much manufacturing capacity as possible. So far, CTAP remains a highly promising but underutilized tool. WHO and our partners can design and advocate for solutions. But we need all countries and all manufacturers to work with us to make them happen. On Friday, WHO's Global Advisory Committee on Vaccine Safety concluded that the available data do not suggest any overall increase in clotting conditions following administration of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. Today, AstraZeneca announced positive results from a trial of the vaccine among more than 32,000 people in Chile, Peru, and the United States. The vaccine was 79% effective in preventing symptomatic COVID-19 and 100% effective in preventing hospitalization and death. No safety concerns were reported. These data are further evidence that the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine is safe and effective. Finally, 
I'm pleased to announce that a shortlist has now been selected from 1,200 entries for the WHO Health for All Film Festival. The films are available on the WHO YouTube channel. And between now and the 10th of May, we're inviting members of the public to watch them and make comments. Our expert jury will select six winners in different categories, with the prizes to be awarded on the 13th of May before our World Health Assembly. Christian, back to you. Dr. Terros, thank you very much. With this, we'll hand over, head over to the questions. Um, please, in case you want to be put onto the queue, raise your hand with the raise your hand icon, and we'll try to get to you. We'll start with Paulina Alcazar from Encadena News Cancun. Paulina, please unmute yourself. Gracias. Gracias, Christian, por tomar mi pregunta. Thank you, Christian, for taking my question. And greetings from the Mexican Caribbean. Now, we know that with new variants, the virus is getting stronger all the time, but children's mental health is being seriously impacted. They've spent a year on their own with family pressure. What updates do you have for the opening of schools? And what can they do uh, if there are high levels of infection amongst the, the childhood population? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Van Kerkhove, please. Thank you. Sorry, I was waiting for to finish the translation of the question. Thank you for the question. Um, so we there's a lot that can be done to open up schools safely. Um, schools operate in communities. And where there is virus transmission, the virus can enter schools as they can enter any type of facilities. So what we have been advising is in, in making sure that transmission is under control in communities so that schools can open up safely. There are a number of ways that schools around the world are starting to open up or have been opened up. And in fact, in some countries, schools haven't closed, um, taking into account a plan in place that when those schools open up, understanding uh, how they can inform parents and students about how to behave appropriately in school in terms of physical distancing, wearing masks if the child is of the right age, um, some of the adults uh, wearing masks in certain areas if the virus is circulating, um, opening up of windows, making sure that there's good ventilation in the school systems, um, making sure that there's a plan in place should there be any students that are sick that need to be tested, um, if any of those children test positive or workers test positive. And a number of school systems have, have um, set approaches to make sure that they have all of the systems in place so that the schools can open. And we're seeing that being done successfully in a number of countries. Um, it's about taking a, a comprehensive approach to be able to do so, but it really starts with controlling transmission in the communities because these schools do not operate um, in isolation. Uh, everybody recognizes the critical importance of opening up schools, not only for children's education, but also for their social well-being, their mental health, and in many parts of the world, this is where children receive food. Um, so it is absolutely critical that schools are opened and that they're opened up safely. Um, there's a lot more that we are starting, we are understanding about transmission uh, amongst uh, children. Children can be infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. We do see different rates of infection among children by age. Luckily, um, so far, of all of the evidence we've seen across countries is that children tend to have a more mild infection, if not asymptomatic infection, but that is not universal. Um, there are some children that have experienced severe disease, and there are some children who have died from infection. But the vast majority of children who are infected tend to have mild disease. This is true with the virus variants as well. We do also know that children can pass the virus to others. Um, it's largely dependent on the mixing patterns that children have um, in terms of um, between each other, between children of the same age, but also between adults and children and children to adults. So there are risks that are associated, but 
there are many countries that are opening up their schools, um, taking this approach, a planned approach, and ensuring that the measures that are in the schools themselves keep the children safe as well as the people who are working at those schools. We have guidance that has been put out that outlines all of the different elements that need to be in place, um, taken at a school district level to make sure that the, that the schools are operating safely. If I could just add a, a note of thanks to our colleagues in, in UNICEF and UNESCO and, and other uh, organizations and national uh, authorities as well. A lot of work has been done in this space to try and make schools as safe as possible and uh, uh, WHO and, and UNICEF UNESCO have been working very, very closely together uh, since the beginning of this epidemic and in fact we've had a, a, a very a superb team of UNICEF staff embedded in uh, our operations since the very beginning of this response. So we'd like to take this moment just to recognize the contribution that agencies like UNICEF have made to protecting children in this space, not just in schools, but in general uh, over the last uh, year or more. Thank you very much, both. Um, with this, we'll stay on that continent and we we'll go to Jamil Shad from UOL. Brazil. Jamil, please unmute yourself. Hello, um, Tarek. This, uh, sorry, Christian. This is Jamil. Um, same continent, uh, different city. Uh, in the case of Brazil, um, uh, the country has now, Dr. Tedros, its fourth Minister of Health. Uh, my question to you is basically, what message would you send the new Minister of Health of Brazil uh, especially uh, in a week that we have just finished with record number of deaths, 15,000 people have died this week in Brazil. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jamil. We'll have Dr. Ryan start. Um, I'm sure the DG was just reaching to congratulate the new minister. Um, but uh, it is a challenge, and many countries have... Uh, have uh, switched to many ministers uh, over the over the last year, but certainly the situation in in Brazil now requires uh, concerted action. I think we've seen it's not just in the Amazonas region, but in other regions of Brazil, the numbers are on the rise, <clears throat> um, and the pressure on the system, particularly the hospital system and the intensive care system, remains very high. Maria may speak to some of the details. Um, of that because uh, we've been working very closely with our colleagues in PAL today to better understand the, the situation on the ground. Um, I think, uh, and Mary Angela is here with us who also knows Brazilian system extremely well. If, if in terms of, of, of I'm not, we're not, uh, we don't presume to tell ministers what to do, but I would say in a country as large as Brazil, working through the state health architecture and working to create and build those relationships and with the municipalities. Health services are strong at municipality level. They're well organized, but I think maybe what Brazil needs is more integration of the municipality to the state to the federal level and getting that moving and working and actually leveraging the capacities and the knowledge and the enthusiasm and the, and, 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 and the capability of the whole system in Brazil. Uh, I said it here before, before, Brazil is a leader in this space of public health. It's, a, it's been a global leader in this space for, for decades and decades. Um, <clears throat> what needs to happen is, in a sense, to leverage all of that, and we wish the Federal Minister the best of luck uh, and would advise that working as closely as possible with the state and municipal health authorities to align and build a cohesive, comprehensive response that can be sustained over time <clears throat> is the same advice we would give effectively to any minister in any large federal state in the world. Thank you. Uh, just so briefly to, to comment on the, the ICU. So um, as, as Mike has said, um, there's uh, quite some high occupancy rates of ICU across many of the federal units. In fact, 25 of the 27 federal units um, across the country have a reported high average ICU occupancy of more than 80 percent um, in the last seven days. So that's across uh, the country. And in the last seven days, the average um, number of cases reported per day is, exceeds 70,000. Um, with more than 2,000 deaths per day. So the, the country is under some heavy burden 
But as you have heard us say many times before, Brazil has a lot of experience of dealing with not only COVID-19, but many infectious diseases. Our country office uh, uh, staff and our regional office staff are working um, with the different federal levels and the state levels to support um, the country and to make sure that those who are needing care receive the oxygen that they need. Vaccination is well underway, and so there's a lot of effort to increase vaccination across the country. Um, but we stand ready uh, as an organization through our regional office and country office to continue to to support Brazil um, to get through these very difficult times. There are variants that are circulating in Brazil as well, the P1 variant, um, as has been reported, and this variant has increased transmissibility, which of course makes things even more challenged, challenging because the more cases you have, um, the more hospitalizations you may have, which will put an, a burden system even under more pressure. Um, but again, we are, we are working through our country office to support um, at the most local level possible to help uh, Brazil, who has exceeding capacities to be able to deal with this, to get through these difficult times. And we have uh, Dr. Simao, maybe also. I'm going to use the opportunity to speak in Portuguese. <laughs> Obrigada, Jamil, pela pergunta e, e pela... Na verdade, nós desejamos ao ministro Marcelo Queiroga muita competência e, e, e firmeza na condução do enorme desafio que hoje tem o Brasil pela frente. E acho que a mensagem extremamente importante, e que ele já, já se posicionou, é, é sobre as políticas de saúde serem baseadas em evidência científica e como o Dr. Mike Ryan acabou de falar, e que também sejam alinhadas nas três esferas de governo. Isso é extremamente importante no momento em que o país enfrenta um perfil mais homogêneo da, da, da epidemia. um alinhamento das posições baseadas em, na evidência científica nos três níveis de governo. Obrigada. Let me hand to Dr. Tedros. Sorry, I didn't uh, hear what you said, but obrigado. <laughs> um, no, our, uh, my colleagues have already uh, said what had to be said. Uh, but I would like to join them in congratulating the new minister, Minister Marcelo Queroga. Um, congratulations. And um, uh, look forward also to working with you very, uh, with the new minister very, very closely. Um, as uh, we have been saying, I think we have said a lot about uh, Brazil. Uh, the situation is very, very concerning. We have a serious concern. Uh, as Maria said, the number of cases is increasing, number of deaths is increasing. Uh, but if you take the number of deaths um, from February 15 to March 15, in just one month, it doubled from around 7,000 per week to 15,000 per week. That's a huge jump, uh, especially when deaths increase. You know what, what it means. Uh, so it has to be taken seriously, the whole, whole Brazil. And what should be done by the government should be done by the government. And what should be done by uh, citizens uh, should be done by them. It's a concerted effort of all actors uh, that will really uh, reverse this upward trend, which is actually very fast and accelerating really really fast because but especially we're worried about the death rate which doubled in just one month from 7,000 to 15,000. So Brazil has to take it seriously whether it's the government or the people. Thank you. Thank you very much all. Thank you Dr. Tedros. We move to Shoko Koyama from NHK. Shoko, please unmute yourself. Hi, Christian, can you hear me? All good, go ahead. Thank you for taking the question. So regarding the distribution of COVAX vaccines, uh, while 
Turkey has distributed over 31 million doses to 57 economies. So, uh, there are many more countries waiting for the arrival of vaccines, and some countries such as Lebanon are claiming it's delay. I imagine each country has different reasons for the delay, but is there any structural problems causing this delay? And is COVAX going to be able to distribute over 300 million doses of vaccines to 145 economies by the end of the second quarter of this year, as initially planned and announced in February? Thank you. Dr. Bruce Elwood, please. Thank you very much, Shoko, and thank you for highlighting the success of the COVAX facility to date. Um, we've seen in four short weeks the COVAX facility uh, very, very rapidly be able to scale up and ensure that these uh, products get to um, every country that we actually had enough vaccine to supply. Um, but the ambitions for COVAX go much beyond that, as you've said. We've already distributed over 30 million doses to 50 uh, countries on multiple continents, but the goal is to get to over 140 countries in the near term, um, and indeed we have 190 countries that are part of the facility in total. Um, there is no question, Shoko, that the facility can deliver that over 300 million doses, as you mentioned, and even more in the near term. Um, I think we've seen in the last couple of uh, weeks some incredible work by the procurement uh, uh, coordinators that are part of uh, COVAX, and that is UNICEF and PAHO. They've been able to very rapidly put in place the purchase orders and very rapidly put the shipping uh, um, uh, uh, pieces in place as well. The problem that we have, quite frankly, is we simply cannot get enough vaccine to be able to keep up, and the manufacturers are right now unable to keep up with our orders. We have two main suppliers to COVAX in this period, um, the uh, Serum Institute of India, which got off to a great start, um, but has had trouble now with its uh, deliveries in March and April. Um, um, and then AstraZeneca itself, which um, ships for us out of, as the Director General said, uh, the facility in Korea has also gotten off to a good start, but uh, is having challenges making, uh, uh, let's say, keeping up with the rate of orders. Um, we are hoping that both uh, companies will be able to scale up and keep up, let's say, with the rate of deliveries that we're aiming for, uh, but we're still having, let's say, some teething problems, not on the part of the COVAX facility, but on the part of the suppliers that are trying to keep up with the uh, demands that we're making. I don't know, Swami, if you want to add. Dr. Swami Nathan, please. Yes, thank you. Just to add that uh, while uh, it is very challenging for uh, vaccine manufacturers to suddenly scale to the billions of doses that we need today in the world, because uh, on an average, the world produces somewhere between three to five billion doses of vaccine per year annual. That's the combined annual output of all the vaccine manufacturers around the world. And now we, we have an additional burden of 10, 12, 14 billion doses that are going to be needed. Um, so there are things that we are encouraging countries and manufacturers to do to ease the situation, particularly over the next few critical months when supplies will not be enough for the demand. And that is encouraging countries who have excess doses to share those through COVAX so that the high-risk priority groups in all countries can be vaccinated. I think the DG has repeatedly put out a call for, for vaccinating, uh, starting vaccinations in all countries in the first 100 days of this year, while young and healthy adults could possibly late, uh, wait till later in the year in, uh, in countries that have enough doses to get vaccinated, because then we can really bring down the deaths that we see are increasing uh, over the last couple of weeks. So that's one concrete step that can help to solve uh, the situation. The other one is collaboration on uh, supply chain issues, making sure that uh, the raw materials and the ingredients that are needed for vaccines, this is a global supply chain. So any unilateral action by any country is going to have repercussions and impacts on all companies that are manufacturing vaccines. So there needs to be a free flow of, uh, of goods across uh, national borders uh, as needed. And then, of course, we encourage manufacturers who have excess bulk product to come forward uh, so that we can link them with uh, those companies that have the fill and finish 
excess capacity. There are many companies who have reached out to the WHO saying they have excess capacity and they are willing to help with fill and finish of the, uh, the bulk product. So there are many things that could be done in the short term, even as we are waiting for more vaccine, uh, vaccines to come on board, but also for companies to be able to scale up their manufacturing. Thank you. Thank you very much, both. Uh, we'll move on to Carmen Paun from Politico. Carmen, please unmute yourself. Carmen, do you hear us? Please unmute yourself. If we don't hear you, maybe we'll come back later to you. Let's move on to Robin Millar from AFP. Robin, please unmute yourself. Thank you. Just um, a question about the, the situation in Europe. Is Europe definitely now looking at a third wave of the pandemic? Thank you. Thanks. So thanks for the thanks for the question. Um, it gives an opportunity to give a, a bit of an update here on the global situation. Um, four of our five WHO regions are seeing an increase in transmission. This is the fifth week in a row globally that we have seen an increase in transmission. In the last week, cases have increased by 8%. In Europe, that is 12%, and that's driven by a, a, several countries across the European region. And a lot of that is driven by the B117 variant that was first identified in the UK that is now starting to circulate in many countries in the eastern part of Europe. Um, we've seen an increase of cases of 49% in our Southeast Asia region, which is largely driven by increase in cases in India and in a number of other countries there. In our Eastern to Mediterranean region, we've seen an increase in, of 8%. And in our Western Pacific region, we've seen an increase in cases of 29%, largely driven by increase in cases in the Philippines and Papua New Guinea. Um, the Americas and Africa have seen a slight decline in the last seven days. But overall, we're seeing increasing trends, and these are worrying trends. Um, in Europe um, and across a number of countries, there's a combination of factors that are associated with increases in transmission. Um, there's pressure to open up uh, in many of these countries, and there are difficulties in, in people and individuals and communities to comply with proven control measures. Um, and we're seeing that across a number of countries. We're also seeing that vaccination is distribution is uneven and it is inequitable, as you've heard many of us say many times, and most notably our Director General. And we do know that these variants of concern, in particular the B117, first identified in the UK, the B1351, which was first identified in South Africa, and the P1 variant that is circulating in Brazil and in a number of countries, these are associated with increased transmission. If you have a combination of factors of virus variants that transmit more easily, if we have a combination of individuals who are fatigued and frustrated because we want this to be over and are perhaps not being supported in carrying out the individual level measures or themselves are not carrying out those individual level measures of physical distancing, mask wearing, hand hygiene, cleaning hands, avoiding crowded spaces, um, you know, taking those individual level measures to reduce our contacts with others. Um, and if we have vaccination that is not yet reaching those who are most at risk, that is a very dangerous combination. And so we want to make sure that as vaccines are rolling out, that we continue to adhere to the individual level measures that keep us and our loved ones safe. Also worrying, I, I do want to mention that it had been about six weeks where we were seeing decreases in deaths. And in the last week, we've started to see a slight increase in deaths across the world. Um, and this is to be expected if we are to see increasing uh, cases, um, but this is also a worrying sign. So there's still far more that we can do at an individual level, at community level measure, as leaders in government to support people to carry out measures that keep each of us safe. And uh, just maybe as, as countries flail around, uh, on these numbers and uh, and making bilateral deals and other things with vaccines, you, the DG reflected on the experience of a country like the Republic of Korea, who stood in line in COVAX, who got hit first and early with this virus, who stuck to the task of surveillance and testing, who not only developed a very successful surveillance and testing regime, but exported those tests around the world, uh, who faced huge clusters of disease, but kept the disease under control uh, in a very significant way, who supported 
uh, people affected, the, quar the quarantined as well as the sick, with excellent clinical care, who, as the DG said, waited in line for COVAX and have numbers of disease that are the envy of the world. And that, again, as I've said previously about Australia, hasn't happened by accident. Every single day is a struggle for every country to keep this disease at low levels of transmission. But by doing that, <clears throat> they've achieved a, a tremendous amount. And I think if we want to see, uh, for Europe and other places, coming out of lockdowns successfully, and countries that have done it successfully have had extremely low levels of community transmission when they've done it. And when they've done it, they've had excellent surveillance and support to quarantine and all the other measures in place. Uh, and they've built that more strongly each time. And now adding vaccine makes this a more uh, realistic uh, objective for everybody. But uh, again, <clears throat> in terms of the European experience, uh, many countries coming out of restrictive measures without good surveillance, uh, without high vac levels of vaccine coverage, um, with a huge amount of fatigue um, at play and understandable fatigue uh, is a recipe for, uh, for uh, larger outbreaks at community level. Uh, and again, we, the, the formula for this <clears throat> may be boring, it may not be attractive, uh, there are no silver bullets, but we have got to get back to strong, comprehensive, strategic approaches to the control of COVID that include vaccination as one of those strategies. <clears throat> I'm afraid we're all trying to grasp at straws. We're trying to find the golden solution. So we just get enough vaccine and we push enough vaccine into people and that's going to take care of it. Um, I'm sorry, it's not. <clears throat> there aren't enough vaccines in the world and they're distributed terribly inequitously. In fact, we've missed a huge opportunity to bring vaccines on board as a comprehensive measure. It's not being implemented in a systematic way. It's a failed opportunity, and as, as the DG says, is a, not only a catastrophic moral failure, but it's an epidemiologic failure, and it's a failure in public health practice. But we have to live with that reality, and we have to do what we can do to fix the situation. The reality is that the disease is on the march again in countries in which we've got opening up natural fatigue, low vaccination coverage, poor surveillance and control measures in place. And we just have got to turn back and face those realities. Um, because uh, we've said it many times, vaccines are a huge addition to controlling and containing COVID, but they are not the only solution. And I'm afraid we are investing way too much in this, um, um, in this as the only solution to fix our problems. Thank you so much for these important points. And we'll try again with Carmen Pound, Politica. Politico. Carmen, please unmute yourself. Thank you so much, and sorry about earlier. Um, I had a question about the um, report about the virus origin uh, mission. Do you have an exact date when you expect that to come out, um, given that um, it was, I think it was postponed from last week? And on AstraZeneca, have you had any countries that have already received uh, shipments to COVAX or are expecting um, shipments to COVAX express any sort of concern about a potential hit and confidence that the vaccine might have taken as a result of, you know, what we've seen um, unfolding around the world over the past week or so? Thank you. Um, I'll leave the <clears throat> AstraZeneca question to our colleagues. Uh, with the regard to, <clears throat> to the report, um, the teams continue to work on it. I believe they're making good progress. We're not directly involved in that process, so I can't tell you exactly where they are line by line. The, the scientific teams continue to finalize the report, um, and it will be published as soon as it is, it is finished. I know we've been asked this before, but uh, I'd love to be able to tell you the exact day and time. I'd love to know that myself. This is science, uh, and this is allowing the teams to finish uh, in a proper and comprehensive way. Uh, Dr. Simao for the AstraZeneca part. Carmen, uh, on the second part of your, your question, if you saw any reluctance or refusal of, of AstraZeneca doses because of the, the issues that were raised last week, no? There were uh, some initial concerns uh, earlier in the year because of the variants from South Africa, you, you have heard, right? But not on the, in a, there were two countries who suspended temporarily the, the use of the AstraZeneca, but it's all 
return to normal. We don't have any countries that are refusing the doses from AstraZeneca in, in the African continent at the moment. Thank you very much. Dr. Swaminathan? We, we've also got, seen the results from the phase three trial uh, in the US, Chile, and Peru uh, today, which um, adds to the database that already existed on the AstraZeneca vaccine, both in terms of efficacy and safety. So it's very encouraging that there was 79% efficacy. 20% of the, of the participants were over the age of 60 years. So again, now we have good data in the older population as well, which was lacking beforehand. And uh, it is highly effective in preventing against severe disease and, uh, and death. So there were five cases in the placebo group and none in the, in, so small numbers again, but it does look like it's, uh, this vaccine like other vaccines is very effective in, in um, preventing severe disease and, uh, and having now shown that it also works in the elderly, I think it's a very good vaccine for all age groups. Um, they looked specifically at events of venous thrombosis and they have not seen any. Of course, the, the size of the trial was 25,000 people or so. So sometimes very rare events will come up only when you have millions of people vaccinated. But it's just adding uh, more data, more confidence that this vaccine is both uh, efficacious and safe. And Dr. Ayla, please. Yeah, thanks for the question, Carmen. As you can imagine, whenever there's news about a vaccine um, or concerns about a vaccine anywhere in the world, we get a lot of questions about it from those who participate in the COVAX facility. And as Mariangela uh, was, was, was alluding to, we got a lot of questions about the AstraZeneca product. But um, there's a lot of confidence in it. Um, the, all countries are going ahead with the uh, vaccine, very, very keen. In fact, as I alluded to in my earlier um, uh, comments, the problem is not a lack of demand. It's quite the contrary. And I think if there's one thing we do, uh, if there are any countries that do have concerns or are not fully utilizing a vaccine, as uh, Sonia said earlier, make it available to the COVAX facility because we have a long list of countries that are very, very keen to use the Astra. AstraZeneca vaccine. We simply uh, cannot get enough of it. Um, as you heard as well, the results from uh, the clinical trials that came out today with data from the U.S., Chile, and Peru has really given a new confidence and, and, and demand for that vaccine. So, uh, so uh, to the contrary, there was certainly due diligence uh, when people did hear about the possibility of an adverse event. They did ask a lot of questions, but uh, the demand for the vaccine is extremely high. Thank you very much. Um, before we move on to the next question, doesn't let me mention there were apparently a couple of questions on AstraZeneca. Um, we won't go into these now because I think it's, it's broadly covered, for example, from Georgia TV. But uh, now we'll move on to John Saracostas from The Lancet. John, please unmute yourself. Yes, good afternoon. Can you hear me? All good. Can you hear me, uh, Christian? Yes, we do. Go ahead. Yes, yes, good afternoon. Yes, I'd like to follow up on uh, Dr. Tedros's comments about inequitable distribution of vaccines. And if he, if he has some answers and uh, some details to concerns that one of the uh, manufacturers is charging more for uh, vaccines to some UN agencies that are procuring it than what the vaccine is being offered in European countries. And specifically, I'm talking about the um, Serum Institute charging $3 per vaccine for UNICEF when the same vaccines are available between $1.80, uh, €1.80 and €2.10 in Europe, where the cost of production is higher. I understand the AstraZeneca deal with the S Serum Institute is an LTA, but if you could shed some light on that, because it's raising concerns about inequity concerning procurement by the UN. Thank you. Thank you very much. John, uh, Dr. Elwood, please. Yeah, John, thank you for the question. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure, uh, as, as you know, we have a, a lot more insight than you do. Um, 
the actual costs of the vaccines are not fully uh, uh, understood and the prices that the different groups are paying for the vaccines. And, you know, coming back to your, your bigger point about inequitable distribution, our big, big concern remains the concern that these vaccines aren't getting to the most vulnerable and needy populations in every country around the world. The issue right now is there's simply not enough vaccine to get to the health care workers of the low-income countries and to get to the uh, to obviously the older populations in those countries. And uh, right now, this is not a financial issue. Right now, this is a problem of access to the product itself. Um, so it's not a differential issue around vaccines and vaccine prices. The issue right now is um, the control of the supply is held by a limited number of uh, countries that have, have procured most of the uh, doses and the early access to those doses. And what we're trying to do is find mechanisms, uh, whether through dose sharing, through donations, uh, through exchanging places in the queue for contracts so that we can move up the line further uh, those doses that need to go to the COVAX facility so that they can get to populations everywhere. Thank you so much, Dr. Elwood. Uh, we'll move on to Sarah Jerving from DIVX. Sarah, please unmute yourself. Thank you so much for taking my question. Um, Reuters published a story over the weekend that said that the Kenyan government is offering COVID-19 vaccines that were provided through the COVAX facility to deaths. Um, COVAX has intended for the first doses to go to high risk and priority groups. In countries, uh, would WHO consider diplomats as high risk and priority groups? Um, and why is COVAX not really seeing country vaccination plans that are submitted to COVAX? Um, from what I understand, it's at a country's discretion as to whether or not they, they want to make these uh, plans public. Um, but this limits the public's ability to check and see whether a government's vaccination campaign are following the, the proposal. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah. We'll start with Dr. Elwood again. So let me start first uh, with the second part of your question about the uh, visibility on the vaccination plans. Um, in fact, as part of the assessment of the readiness of every country to be able to accept and utilize vaccines optimally, um, we do look at, the COVAX facility does look at the national, what we call national vaccines deployment plans of all of the uh, countries that are part of COVAX, especially the countries that will, uh, what we call the AMC countries. So the uh, facility has, has quite a good view because part of it's a, it's a nine part plans. So there's a lot of complex uh, aspects of those, but one aspect is how they will roll out the vaccine with respect to the priority populations. And um, virtually every country, sometimes there's a little difference one way or another, but virtually every country um, gives first priority to what we call those frontline workers, the healthcare workers, and then the next level of priority is the, early popu uh, is the older populations. Now, in developing those plans, um, we have been asking countries to ensure that they include all populations that are resident in the countries, um, ranging from uh, some vulnerable populations like migrants, et cetera, to ensure that they are refugees, to ensure they're included, but similarly, other populations that are resident, such as UN workers, uh, et cetera. But at the same time, the request is that we follow the same prioritization. So if there are healthcare workers among those who are uh, exposed, older populations, populations with comorbidities, it should follow the same order. So that is um, uh, what uh, the Secretary General actually has reached out to countries where we have UN uh, um, uh, uh, teams and asked that they also be included, but included in the same way that the other populations would be. Now, we've seen different reports about what that means in different countries, but we are working with countries to ensure that the prioritization is the same as it would be, obviously, for the national populations. Thank you very, thank you very much, Dr. Elwood. We'll move to the next question, and we'll go with Konstantin Yonata Mishvili from Georgian TV, please. Yeah. Thank you, Konstantin Yonata Mishvili for TV channel Rustavi to Georgia. Dear colleagues, uh, as you know, Georgia received AstraZeneca vaccines through the COVAX platform, for which we are grateful. Unfortunately, four days ago, a medical nurse, Maggie Bakradze, 
died from complications, complications after receiving AstraZeneca vaccine on a live TV broadcast. This incident in the context of the recent international investigation in AstraZeneca has caused great mistrust and concerns in Georgia. I'm afraid this incident has practically stopped vaccination. Do you think WHO could send a mission to Georgia as soon as possible to assess the case and bring back confidence to the Georgian people? This is my question. Thank you. Dr. Simao, please. Let me start and then colleagues can complement. And unfortunately, very bad news about the nurse falling you in and passing away, and, and this is most regrettable. On the other hand, we did have a very extensive review of all the, the, all the deaths that have occurred that were allegedly linked to the vaccine. We also had a, an extensive review of the, of the presence, what we call the incidence of different coagulation related disorders in people who received uh, uh, the AstraZeneca vaccines. So uh, not only WHO, but also the, uh, the European Medicines Agents has done a very complete uh, look at all patients' records, all the available evidence and so on, and concluded that, that uh, the link to very severe rare events, and we're not talking about, we're talking one in a million or maybe two in a million that can possibly be linked to vaccination. And uh, the conclusion was that the, the risk of the COVID infection itself, which has killed more than 2.6 uh, 2 million people globally, is much, much higher. So what we say is that the, the, the benefit of the vaccine outweighs enormously any risk that may arise from, from a, a, a potential side, event, side effect. So we, we are very happy to support it through the Georgian office and also to any, you know, a panel discussion, anything with the Georgian regulators and with the public in general to re, re, reboot the, the trust in the confidence in the vaccine. The vaccine is good. There is plenty of evidence that it, the, it, it has very good cost, uh, how to say, cost benefit in relation to preventing deaths from COVID. And maybe the colleagues can complement. Dr. Sumya. Yes, Dr. Swaminathan, please. We, you know, in addition to what Dr. Simao just said, we understand that this was a case of uh, anaphylaxis, which is a very severe allergic reaction to a component uh, of the vaccine. And this has been reported with um, some of the other vaccines, also the mRNA vaccines that are being uh, very widely used in the United States, for example. And it occurs, you know, and again, it's very rare, so it could be anywhere between two to four per million um, vaccines administered. This happens also with, you know, with other vaccines that are commonly used. So um, the, the guidance for to minimize this is really, uh, firstly, to make sure that that all um, vaccinations are done in um, a situation where there are healthcare workers, it's a healthcare facility, and where there's availability of um, the medicines that you would need to treat someone who develops a severe allergic reaction or an anaphylactic shock. And, and normally this could be treated if it happens in a health facility which, which is equipped. Um, secondly, to observe everyone who receives the vaccine for about 30 minutes or so, particularly if they have a history of previous anaphylaxis, then they really need to be very closely observed by the uh, medical personnel. And I think it will be important now to really send out the message that these are very, very rare events that occur. We try to minimize the impact by doing these things, taking the precautions, making sure that people are observed after vaccination, making sure that the facilities where the doses are being given have the necessary uh, medicines available to treat someone who gets an allergic reaction and to reassure people that uh, the benefits of preventing COVID far, far outweigh uh, the risks of uh, these vaccines. 
Thank you very much both for these answers. I will move to Gunilla van Hall from Svenska Dagbladet. Gunilla, please unmute yourself. Yes, can you hear me? Go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry, it's not a question in AstraZeneca, um, but uh, actually not all countries are going ahead after uh, the vaccine was given the green light by the EMA and WHO last week. Among those countries are the Nordics, uh, Sweden and Norway. They want to do further studies. There have been three deaths in Norway that could possibly, possibly have a link to the vaccine. So what risk do you see that the confidence in the AstraZeneca and also in other vaccines are being undermined by countries acting differently. Uh, and perhaps as a, if you have a general message, how Nordic governments and Sweden specifically could best respond to people's worry about the, the AstraZeneca vaccine. Thinking also about the Nordic countries having the experience, the bad experience from the pandemics that led to the narcolepsy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gunilla. Thank you very much, Gunilla. We'll start with Dr. Um, Simao, please. Thank you, Gunilla. And let me start again, and colleagues can compliment. Uh, we, of course, understand the concerns the Nordic countries have expressed and, and that they need to, to do additional uh, they wish to do an additional investigation uh, regarding the po potential uh, adverse events. However, we also do understand that the, the, the review that the, the European Medicines Agency was very extensive, and it, <coughs> it engaged not only experts and regulators from across Europe, but other regions of the world. So we, we will wait until this, the, the regulatory agencies in these countries make a final decision. But if, of course, the, the EMA is also calling for additional investigation, but it's very clear so far, and there's a very clear recommendation also from WHO's Global Advisory Committee on Vaccine Safety, as we also looked at uh, 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 reports from other regions, with, uh, and we did not find uh, any strong link to the same type of severe rare events that are referred to in Europe and also in the Nordic countries. It looks like uh, it's been covered. Thank you very much. Then we'll move to Emir Milovic from N1 Bosnia, Bosnia please. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, please. Um, just to follow up on uh, what Dr. Tedros has said at the start, that we have a big gap in vaccination, that he has uh, hard talks with the big countries and the small countries, and also what Dr. Ryan says, that this is a um, very bad situation for um, all of us. So my question is, isn't it time to bring a big political guns into the story, such as the Secretary General Guterres or EU leaders or other world leaders to deal with these questions and not only Dr. Tedros to deal with um, all these um, issues. Maybe broader political action is needed here. Maybe regional leaders or global leaders to um, pressure those who are not willing to cooperate in making this situation even worse than it is at the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emir. We'll start with Dr. Elwood, please. Uh, thank you very much, Emir. In, in fact, uh, right from the beginning of the pandemic, as you've been aware, um, global leaders have been involved with trying to find solutions for every aspect of this crisis. I mean, this has hit societies, hit economies, hit health systems so hard right from the very beginning. We've had uh, these issues discussed and dealt with at the very top of government. You may remember at the UN General Assembly back in September, the Secretary General himself 
with the Director General and the Heads of State. Um, if I remember correctly, President Ramaphosa, uh, um, Prime Minister Solberg, and others were part of that event. Um, and it brought together the top of governments as well as the top of the multilateral system, specifically on the issue of vaccine equity and the scale up and financing of the COVAX facility. Um, since then, there has been a regular dialogue with the top of the European Commission, the top of various governments around the world to find solutions in terms of dose sharing, in terms of, uh, in terms of, um, of financing the ACT Accelerator as well. You'll remember just in the last few, uh, the last month, the G7 leaders came out with very strong commitments about uh, dose sharing, about vaccination, and discussed that at the uh, G first G7 summit held under the presidency of uh, the United Kingdom. Um, you saw at that, and immediately afterward, uh, both uh, Prime Minister uh, Johnson and then uh, President Macron of France coming out strongly on the need to be finding these solutions and sharing doses. So I think we have the attention. Um, I cannot tell you how often the Director General himself is in conversation with heads of state as they search for solutions uh, to equitable access. So those discussions are, are happening. Um, it's just very, very challenging, and it's a challenge both because of the expectations of uh, countries themselves and their own populations, but then also the challenges we're having in the supply chains. Um, the Director General talked earlier about the extraordinary work that AstraZeneca is doing to make sure that its vaccine is truly available on a global basis, but then there are all the challenges of scaling up the supply, the delivery, the labeling, the packaging, etc. Um, so it is a complex business. It is getting the attention of the very tops of government, but more attention is needed because we still do not have the equitable rollout that's needed to uh, ensure as many countries as possible, many populations as possible, benefit from vaccines as they are rolled out. Yeah. Just a bit I would like to add uh, to that. Um, I think um, there was broader uh, uh, participation of um, political leaders uh, and the call started actually in, in April uh, and there was broad participation. And uh, as you said, Secretary General was part of it, many leaders were part of it, um, and many actually have been repeating the word um, when vaccines become available, they should be global public goods. Uh, and we were very happy to hear that. So the question now, I don't think is another convening. The question now is translating the pledge into action. So what we call walking the talk. Um, so I don't think it's a matter of convening anymore or broader political mobilization. It's a matter for each and every country that has pledged to support this to make it uh, happen. Uh, but as you said, we will not uh, give up on this and we will continue to, to push. And we would like to see the pledges or the commitments translated into action and that people uh, walk their, their, their talk. Uh, so that's where, where, where we are. Otherwise, the participation of leaders I think you have been following this since April, especially 2020, was significant, and we were very much encouraged by that. But the action is not coming. So what we're saying now is what was promised should be, I think, honored, and we should deliver now. Um, of course, there are people who say um, from uh, so far how COVAX delivered um, you know, there is progress. Of course there is progress. Uh, but what we are saying is it's not enough. Um, and I want to point out, though, uh, one thing when, uh, you know, they talk about the progress now, they try to compare it with what happened with HIV treatment. 
which took the world 10 years actually to reach uh, the low income countries, you know, after it started in high income countries. If you compare it to that, okay, there is progress. Some countries are getting vaccines. If you compare it to the vaccines of H1N1, that the vaccines arrived in low income countries after the pandemic was over, okay, you can consider it uh, progress. But if you see it in relation to the uh, um, seriousness of this pandemic, uh, I don't think the progress is, is enough because unless we end this pandemic as soon as possible, it can keep us hostage for more years to come. And that's why we're sh saying sharing the vaccine is in the interest of all countries and that all countries if they go for lives and livelihoods to come back to, to normal, uh, they, they, they have to share and they have to honor their, their, their pledges. So I think there was a lot of platform, there was a lot of pledge and um, a lot of uh, support for vaccine equity. And we're saying that should really happen in its uh, time to make it uh, happen. I think we're very clear on this um, because if there is a delay in vaccine equity, if there is a delay in vaccine coverage, uh, the consequence will be the virus will get a space and time to mutate. And even the vaccines we have now may not, may not work. So the race is against time. Time is the essence. And we have to, we have to increase production as soon as possible and increase the vaccination coverage as soon as possible so the virus could be squeezed out, meaning denying the virus a space and striking fast so it will not get the time to, to mutate. And this is in the interest of all uh, countries. So that's what we're, we're saying. And this is very clear. I think everybody understands it. And we have to uh, remind the world to do the right things. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tedros, for these important words. Now, we reached to the end of the question and answers. Before I give back to Dr. Tedros for the final remarks, let me invite Dr. Teresa Kazaeva. She is the director for WHO's uh, TB program uh, for some remarks on World TB Day, which we're commemorating in two days on 24 March. Dr. Kasseva. Uh, thank you very much, Christian and Dr. Tedros, colleagues. Uh, it's a pleasure to join you. While it was expected that the main questions, even in the World TB days, will be about uh, COVID, and it's uh, fully understandable and reasonable, uh, I must say that so-called all diseases, uh, silent epidemics, should not be neglected, and TB is one of these epidemics. And uh, uh, our great concern is uh, uh, in the shadow of COVID pandemic, uh, which is ongoing, uh, uh, our old uh, uh, silent monster is growing. And uh, uh, the trends are very concerning. And I would like to request you, especially uh, uh, those officials in the high burden countries to pay attention as soon as possible, because uh, the situation may go out uh, of the control, and we know even that few months of neglection of diseases like TB can uh, uh, then request decades of, of uh, a very tight, very hard fight and to bring back to normal. And now, already based on the data, latest data we are now collecting on monthly base, and this is one of the lessons we've learned from the COVID pandemic, we see that number of so-called missing people from 2.9 million last year grown up to 4.1 million. It's, it's huge progress and, uh, and uh, as soon as possible we'll uh, pay attention as easy it will be for us to mitigate all this risk. We still have time uh, to combat and TB uh, is preventable and curable disease. Um, uh, and with the new WHO guidelines, we have even more opportunities. Uh, we, uh, we can provide a two, three times shorter treatment, fully oral treatment, home-based treatment, and uh, there should not be excuses for neglection uh, of uh, people. The poorest, the most margin, uh, mar marginalized. And WHO will, will 
um, help will provide all necessary support and technical support to all the countries and which we are doing already. So uh, let's not neglect uh, TB, clock is ticking. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kasaiva. Um, I'll remind everyone that the sound files from this briefing will be sent shortly after the briefing and the transcript can be found on the web on our sites tomorrow morning. Now I'll hand over to Dr. Tedros for the final remarks. Dr. Tedros. Thank you, thank you, Christian. So I, I just would like to say thank you to all who have joined today and look forward to seeing you in our upcoming conference. Uh, press conference. Thank you.